Hey, Paloma here. How's it going? Nice to see you all. Uh, so I'm here with C-Smart. We are an organization that teaches people about protecting our oceans. And we have a program called Ocean Defender. So it's a self-led course for kids just like you to learn all about cool marine animals and what we can do to help protect them. There's one game I like to play called Two Truths and a Lie. And that's what we're gonna do now. So how it works is I say three statements. Two of them are gonna be true and one of them is going to be the lie. And you have to identify which one is the lie. Alrighty, let's get started with the game. So three statements. One, the Great Bear Rainforest is the largest temperate rainforest in the world. Is that true? The Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia? the largest temperate rainforest in the world? Two, the Great Bear Rainforest gets 80% of its nitrogen from salmon. So 80%, so more than half of all of its nitrogen. So that's the nutrient that's in the soil that helps plants grow. Do they get that from salmon? Three, the Great Bear Rainforest has five different species of bears living there. Are there five species of bears? in the Great Bear Rainforest in British Columbia? Hmm, all right, have a think. Which one was a lie? It was number three. There are not five species of bear in the Great Bear Rainforest, there's only two. We only have two species of bears in British Columbia. We have the black bear and the grizzly bear. Of course, we have the spirit bear, which is uh, the light colored bear uh, that's very rare. And we, that is not an actual species though, because it's, a, it's something we call a subspecies. And it's a subspecies of the black bear. Hmm, all right, so only two um, species in the Great Bear Rainforest. But the other statements were pretty interesting. So the Great Bear Rainforest receives 80% of its nitrogen from salmon. That's right, something that comes from our oceans, from our waters. A fish is giving its nutrients to the forest. So the forest depends on the ocean for the nutrients that it has there. And how that works is salmon, they, um, they're born in the river. So that's where they spawn. They um, grow up when they're young. And then they go out to the ocean and that's where they grow big. So they're getting all of the nutrients from eating things in the ocean. And then they come back up a river to spawn again to reproduce and as they're doing that lots of animals including bears are eating these salmon and then they're bringing the carcasses to the forest they're also defecating in the forest and then that is what's giving a lot of the nutrients that uh, to the forest that they're the plants need to grow so there's a big connection between our oceans and our land it's not a disconnected we all all relying on each other all right, should we play another round of Two Truths and a Lie? Okay, let's see if you can get this one right. Three statements. One, ooh, I have to premise this. This starts with, it's actually about um, two species of plants. One of them is Douglas fir, which is a coniferous tree. And the other one is about eelgrass, which is an aquatic plant. So it lives in marine environments, just like the grass on your lawn, except in um, the ocean. Hmm. Okay, so thinking about these two species, three statements. One, both Douglas fir and eelgrass are non-flowering plants. So that means they do not produce flowers. So Douglas fir is like um, a coniferous tree in the forest. Does that produce flowers? What about eelgrass? Do they produce flowers? So if neither of them produces flowers, then that statement is false. Two, Douglas fir and eelgrass have chlorophyll. So chlorophyll is a green pigment essential to photosynthesis. So plants photosynthesize. Do both Douglas fir, a coniferous tree in our forest, and eelgrass, a marine plant, do they both, both have chlorophyll? Hmm. Three, both Douglas fir and eelgrass have roots. So roots are 
the uh, growth parts of the plants that go under the soil um, help secure them and also where they can get nutrients from, from the soil. So do marine plants like eelgrass, do they need roots? Alrighty, out of these three statements, which one was false, which one was a lie? It was number one. Yeah, so Douglas fir and eelgrass um, are non-flowering plants. That is false because eelgrass is a flowering plant. So I told you, eelgrass is just like the grass on our lawn except in our uh, marine environments. And the grass that we have on our lawns outside, those are flowering plants. They are angiosperms. Yeah, does it look like they get flowers? Well, you might not think when you look at a blade of grass, you might think that it doesn't look like it, have fl it has flowers because it doesn't have one of the flowers that you're maybe used to seeing that have really big, bright petals. But it is, it's a flowering plant and the flowers are really tiny, but you can see them at certain times of the year. And in some of the larger grasses, you can see them, they can be quite um, large and uh, a little more developed and more uh, akin to what we describe as a flower. But flowers come in all shapes and sizes and all angiosperms, all flowering plants, um, go through that flower cycle, which is the reproductive cycle, where to spread pollen and for it to go to the female parts of the plant. But conifers, the Douglas fir, they are not, they are non-flowering plants. So they were evolved um, earlier than uh, flowering plants did. And they're part of something we call gymnosperms. All right, so now you've learned more about some of the relationships, some of the similarities between our marine environments and our forests. And I hope you're enjoying learning all about forests today. Again, this was Paloma with Sea Smart. And if you are interested in learning more about marine animals, come and join us for our Ocean Defender program. Visit us at www.seasmartschool.com. All right, see you next time. Bye.